Okay, uh, so it's six two guys. We will start quickly. Firstly, uh, it's been a week. We've had a class, so I'm hoping everybody is doing good and also had a good week in the past, right? So welcome back. Firstly, welcome back to your own channel, scholars. And yeah, so today it's a uh, Wednesday, so therefore we'll be having a class for standard twelfth. And just to give you a heads up as to what we will be discussing in today's class. we are going to start the next chapter right which is titled as the imperial capital uh, vijayanagara basically we'll be dealing with the south india this time in particular right so that's the basic structure or, or the theme of the class but in the meanwhile um, we'll quickly go through the introductions which will which will um, give time for other people to join as well right So firstly my name is Nikita as most of you all know by now and uh, I teach history at an academy scholars channel and I take classes for both standard 11th and 12th right uh, a little bit about telegram scholars uh, channel actually it's very very helpful and I highly urge you all to go join the telegram channel the link for that is in the description below of this video go check it out because if there are any updates or uh, cancellation or be it postponing of classes on the youtube channel you will be given intimation on the telegram channel so highly urge you all to go join it and as far as the emerge test is concerned for the 12thies it's a scholarship test organized by the an academy uh, platform you will have access to free mock live tests which are conducted every week right and the most uh, advantage thing is that these tests are aligned with the latest cbsc guidelines so that will act as some kind of practice for your term one boards so really really helpful again the link for this is in the description below go check it out the dates for this week are 16 17 18 and also 19th of august uh, sorry 19th of october right So enroll yourselves and take part in the quiz. The timings are five to six thirty p.m. on these four days, right? And quickly moving on to discuss a couple of an academy's plus features. Um, firstly, you can set up your own houses and listen to some of the live classes taught by top educators of India, and all of them are available on one single platform. You don't really have to juggle between various websites slash apps because. there's unlimited access to all of these at one place and there are reg regular doubt clearing sessions regular answer writing sessions along with that there is a provision for practice tests and live test series as well then there's exhaustive coverage of syllabus so every topic or theme is covered by educators at an academy plus then there's finally mentorship given to you along with particular guidance which is really really helpful and lastly there are study materials which are provided in the form of pdfs again very highly helpful during the times of your revision or just before the exams so as far as the pricing is concerned for an academy plus there are six ranges of subscriptions firstly it's a 3 month subscription then there's 9 12 15 18 and 24 right the prices are clearly visible on the screen here for respective durations have a look at them and feel free to subscribe to whichever one you feel comfortable right and quickly moving on to iconic um here the features are even better and greater when compared to an academy plus in the sense that there's personal mentorship given to you like a one on one guidance one on one mentor um there are live doubt solving sessions there are weekly reports along with that there is a direct parent connect your mentor and your parent can have a conversation regarding how your studies are going on right then then finally there are study planners provided uh, in terms of time tabling it will make your job much easier so just like a uh, plus iconic also has the same durations 3 9 12 15 18 18 and 24 months uh the pricing might hike a little bit here because of the special features uh again have a look at them and go ahead with whichever one you feel comfortable right and lastly before going on to the actual content for today let me just tell you that there is some kind of free content or like special classes which you can access by using a particular code which is tum10 
right so firstly you need to download the unacademy learning app on your mobile phone um, obviously from the google play store and then log into the app with proper credentials select your goal which is 12th standard and then on the menu button uh, which is on the top left corner select special it will ask you for a code uh, type in tum10 and then you will be given access to the free content right again these are highly organized and systematized again which are greatly beneficial so i highly urge you all to start looking at the special classes okay cool so that's a little bit of the pitch quickly without any further ado we will move on to the next chapter as i was telling you right like we've had a quiz on chapter 6 done and dusted there but now we have to start another like i think this is the last chapter for your term one boards so we'll quickly finish this followed by uh, one shot revisions right so firstly hello hello everyone who just joined right now uh, and also good evening rishi is here with us uh, hello rishi riya shreshta hello um cool anyway so the basically the point i was making was we were start, we are starting chapter 7 which is titled as the imperial capital vijayanagara right we have come across this uh, particular empire vijayanagara a couple of times while we were dealing with chapter 4 and uh, 6 but we haven't had the time to discuss in detail back then but now it's time for us to discuss literally everything about Vijayanagara right be it the polity be it the economy be it the society be it art literature architecture religion right so everything we will be discussing about Vijayanagara in this particular chapter and it's also um, just to give you a hint as to what centuries we'll be talking about. It's roughly 14th to 16th, right? Like the main purpose is 14th to 16th because Vijayanagara ruled in those two particular centuries. But a couple of decades here and there, we'll just pass through, right? So that's a quick overview. So cool, we will start. Uh, Ayush just joined us. Uh, hi, Ayush. Cool. Uh, we'll start, guys. So, Vijayanagara, right? Like, if you literally translate Vijayanagara into English terms, Vijay is nothing but victory, right? Like, even in Hindi or Sanskrit, the literal meaning of Vijay is victory, right? Like, Nagar is a city. So, basically, if you translate it, it means city of victory, right? So, this is one such particular name which was given by the scholars or the historians later on. But it was not called as Vijayanagara back in those days, right? We'll also look at what it was called. But just remember that this is a name given by the scholars, right? Um, it's an empire name, but alongside it is also the name of the capital city, right? So if anybody asks you what is the capital city of the Vijayanagara empire, Vijayanagara city itself is the capital, right? The names are the same for both empire and city. And again, it was roughly founded in the 14th century to be very specific, somewhere in 1338, if I'm not wrong, but we'll just go back to the dates again, right? So roughly 14th century and in its heyday, right? right? So heyday is basically during its peak period, like the top period where it almost captured so many areas um, under the same umbrella right so during its peak period if you look at the boundary or the territory of the Vijayanagara empire you will be very surprised to see that it almost stretched from river Krishna in the north right to the extreme south of the peninsula what is the extreme south like today's Kerala Tamil Nadu your Kanyakumari, so all, he, all these are the extreme southern points of the Indian Peninsula and Krishna River is somewhere in the southern Maharashtra, northern Karnataka region, right? So all of the territory that V shape we have in the Indian map today, all of that was ruled by the Vijayanagara Empire during its peak period, right? So that's how big the territory was. And it was going smoothly, but all uh, because of so many invasions from its neighboring territories and one such invasion happened in the year 1565, 
right? We'll talk about the details of 1565 further in this chapter. But just remember that a certain battle happened, which is called as Battle of Tallikota, right? It happened between the Vijayanagara Empire versus the Delhi Sultanates, right? So Delhi Sultanates, uh, Bijapu, I'm sorry, it's not Delhi Sultanates, it's Deccan Sultanates. I'm really sorry, guys. So it's Deccan Sultanates versus uh, Vijayanagara Empire. So Deccan Sultanates was actually an alliance, right? It's not just one king, but there was Golconda king, Bijapur king, Bidar king, uh, Ahmednagar, right? So all of these Deccan Sultanate rulers came together, they formed an alliance, and then they waged a war against um, Vijayanagara Empire, right? So in 1565, roughly, we can say that it, it started losing its prominence because it lost most of its territories to Deccan Sultanates. So that's why we can say that the city was sacked, basically destroyed, right? And people started leaving the city and going to some other places to settle down. Yeah. So finally, like the ultimate destroyal or like the ultimate ruins we see of Vijayanagara was in 17th, 18th centuries, right? Physically, it was gone. Like there were no material remains, there were no temple architectures or sculptures and stuff like that. But it was so great, like it had so much significance that even after the physical city was gone, like the physical city being destroyed, people still remembered the city in their memories, right? Because that's how great the city was in terms of architecture, in terms of temples, in terms of the society in general. Right? So it was so spectacular that people remembered it even after its ruins. Right? So again, this is basically around the Krishna Tungabhadra Doab. Right? So what is a Doab, guys? Uh, if you all have learnt this in geography, a Doab can be basically defined as the land between the two rivers. Right? If, if for example, two rivers are flowing, then there's one certain land between the do, uh, rivers, right? So that is called as Doab. So between the Krishna River and the Tungabhadra River, whatever uh, places are there, whatever region is there, that is basically the central um, the central land for the Vijayanagara um, Empire back in those days, right? So remember these two rivers, again, very important in terms of your exams. It's Krishna and Thungabhadra Doab, right? And yeah, so days passed by uh, 17th century, 18th century, almost we are into the 19th and people almost remembered this city very fresh in their memories and instead of its original name, they started calling it as Hampi, right? I'm pretty sure most of y'all must have visited Hampi because it's such a spectacular, grandeur place, right? You have all these amazing architectures, like temple architectures and all. So if y'all um, haven't visited, if you get a chance, please go visit Hampi. It's spectacular, right? So it's called as Hampi now, right? And basically the name or the term of Hampi is derived from the local mother goddess by name Pampa Devi, right? So name after the goddess, this name of this, uh, the name of the city was also given. Yeah. Um, okay, Ayush has uh, something to say. I think it's regarding the Doab, right, Ayush? So Ayush basically says it's a river basin. Um, roughly, I would say yes, Ayush, but not uh, specifically, right? So I explain, right? Like, for example, I'll just draw a figure weight. This is uh, Krishna river flowing and then there's Tungabhadra river flowing, right? So this particular area is called as the Doab, right? But river basin is slightly a different thing. So I would highly urge you all not to get confused, right? Um, cool. I hope that answers uh, Ayush's question. Uh, okay, yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. So we were here, right? So the city is gone. Like city is in ruins, 
then how will we get to know information about that city? Right? One major question which we need to ask ourselves as history students. You know, like how did historians actually get to know so much information about Vijayanagara Empire? We have different sources, just like we have sources for everything. Right? So, mostly they are oral traditions. Right? I was saying you how people remembered it in their memories. Yeah, uh, even after the city was in ruins, they started talking about it. They started talking about the kings, right? How great they were, how efficient the administration was, how fair the society was, you know, like what kinds of great literature was produced in those days. So everything, right? Everything was passed down orally from one generation to another. And historians went, surveyed, they researched. And then when they got the information, they finally wrote so many books, right? Even though oral traditions are very, very important as a source, uh, the other sources we have are archaeological finds, right? Carry out your excavations, you will come across something which is a part of the Vijayanagara Empire. Be it ruins of the buildings, be it pottery, be it any materials people must have used, be it the burial grounds, right? Any archaeological finds for that matter. And then there are some temples which are still there. Yeah, some great monuments. And finally, we also have inscriptions, right? The study of inscriptions, as we know, is epigraphy. So epigraphists have, have studied inscriptions and they also provided us with a lot of information. And finally, all of these sources combined, we have something called the history of Vijayanagara Empire, right? So that's like a brief introduction to this uh, lesson. We'll be talking about it uh, in detail in today's class as well as for the classes. But I'm hoping the intro is clear. Right? Okay. We'll quickly move on to the next slide. But in case there are any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat box. Right? I'll quickly answer them. Okay. So now we'll actually look at how the city is discovered. Like whatever happened has happened in 14th, 15th and 16th centuries. But once it's gone, in the 21st century, the fact that we are learning about Hampi, how did we get to know all of this information? Right? Was there any one particular person who gets all the credit? Or is it a teamwork? How did the excavation happen? How did the discovery of Hampi happen? Right? So we'll look into that in this particular sub-theme. So firstly, we'll quickly jump back to year 1800, right? Three, almost uh, more than three, three centuries earlier. Um, there is a particular person by name Colin Mackenzie, right? He was a colonel. So his name is Colin Mackenzie and by profession he was an engineer and later in his life he was also interested in studying about different sites. Yeah, we have a particular term for that which is antiquarian. Antiquarian is like studying old things, right? Like studying vintage things. So Colin Mackenzie was very interested in that and in the year 1800 he visited Humpy he stayed there for a couple of years and started studying Humpy from various angles, right? Um, a little bit about him. He was basically an employee of the English East India Company, right? That in English East India Company came and settled in India so many years before. And he was working as some kind of official under that uh, company, right? And he can be given the credits for preparing the first survey map of the site, right? If you ju just randomly go to Google and like look at some kind of survey maps of the sites, these are all those uh, drawings you have, right? Like a rough estimate of the city. Like this is a street, you know, like, I don't know, I'm very bad at drawings, but just bear with me. Uh, and this is a plot or like a city, right? These are roads and then here there's a temple. These are houses. Right? This is a forest. So these are all like rough maps of the city itself. So these are ca called as survey maps. 
and the person who actually can be given credits for designing the first survey map for Humpy is Colin McKenzie, right? So that is the importance of Colin McKenzie when it comes to Humpy. And lastly, um, whatever information he got in the initial days, uh, all of that he interviewed so many priests of the Virupaksha temple and the shrine of Pampa Devi. So again, these are two important temples in the city of Hampi. So Virupaksha temple is in present day Balari district, right? So th this is basically a Shiva temple. We look at the temple in detail in the next classes. But the point here is Colin McKenzie went to these temples in 1800. He interviewed all these um, priests or, or like those Brahmins or gurus working in the temple. Yeah, they might have told some information, right? So all of that information he kind of used to produce a report in the initial stages about Humpy, right? So that was the contribution of Colin McKenzie. Um, you're absolutely right, Ayush. Antiquarian is nothing but related to something antique. Absolutely right. So he studies antique things and therefore he's called as an antiquarian. Cool. Uh, we'll quickly shift to the next slide. Uh, so that was about Colin McKenzie. We'll talk about him in detail in the next slide. But for now, coming back to the discovery of Humpy in general, right? So now we'll quickly move half a century forward and we'll talk about the year 1856, right? So in 1856, what happened is uh, there was a photography medium right? The photography started gaining importance. So people or like scholars actually started taking photographs of Humpy, like whatever ruins are there. And then they started analyzing those photographs. They started, you know, like looking at the minute of the details in the photographs. And then they started writing all these accounts, right? And again, going back to 1836, all of these epigraphists, basically people who study inscriptions, they also came across dozens and dozens of inscriptions within the Humpy region, right? And these inscriptions are usually found outside the temples. Yeah, so they studied these inscriptions as well. So in different sets of time periods, different people put in effort, yeah, to write a history on Humpy. That is the point I'm basically trying to convey here, yeah? And not just epigraphists, not just photographs, not just Colin McKenzie, but lastly, another source of information available to us or the historians is um, the accounts, yeah, like the written works, uh, firstly, of foreign travelers, right? People from different uh, regions of the world used to come and visit um, South India, especially the Vijayanagara Empire either for trade purposes or be it anything else. But when they came in, they used to write certain accounts or books and leave them behind, right? So if you study those foreign accounts or foreign travelers, you will get to know some kind of information and also locally written um, books, locally written literature. Um, the fact that it is a part of the Southern India Right? Mostly the languages that were spoken are Telugu and Kannada because it spread over the present day Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, Telangana, right? And some parts of Tamil Nadu was also involved in Vijayanagara Empire and therefore Tamil literature was also produced and Sanskrit was like a universal language, the whole of Indian subcontinent and therefore Sanskrit literature was also produced, right? So we have n number of sources here. That's the point I'm trying to make. Right? Cool. So that was the discovery of Humpy on a very basic level. Right? So now we'll quickly move on to source one of your textbook. It is titled as Colin McKenzie, which, be, which means that we will be talking about Colin McKenzie in detail, like his personal life, his occupation, when did he die, and what did he do while he was alive. You know, like basic stuff, his contributions. Cool. So 
Colin Mackenzie, he was born in the year 1754, right? And then eventually he studied in England itself. He finished his education. He became an engineer by profession. Yeah. And then slowly when he came to India to serve under the English East India Company, he developed an interest to become a surveyor and also a cartographer. Cartographer is basically the person who draws maps, right? Designing of the maps is called as cartography and the person who does that is a cartographer, right? So Colin, Z, uh, Colin McKenzie is one of the cartographers as well. And in the year 1815, right, he was appointed as the first surveyor general of India. Before 1815, we never had that post itself. That position never existed. But when this position was created for the first time in 1815, he became the first general. And he was almost there for six years in that post until he died in the year 1821. Right. So that's uh, Colin McKenzie's time period from 1754 to 1821. And what did he do? Right. Like he must have done something, you know, like worth remembering. That is why we're talking about him. Right. So what exactly did he do? Um, firstly, he embarked on collecting local histories and surveying historic sites. Like the amount of research that he has put into studying Hampi is enormous because he actually stayed at the place of Hampi for so many years. He started interviewing people. He started conducting surveys. He started collecting local histories like oral traditions. He visited so many places, taken accounts of so many things, right? So he did, he literally put in so much effort and finally he published all his accounts yeah, to give us a history of Hampi and it also kind of made easier for the English East India Company and later the British, British Crown itself, right? Be because once they understood what India is like or what Hampi is like, it is easier for the British administration or the British government to govern India, to administer India, right? So whatever work he has done is useful in two ways, right? Because he reconstructed the past of the uh, Vijayanagara empire, number one. Number two, because of the work he did, uh, it kind of became easier for the British government to administer Hampi, right? So that's like a two-folded benefit because of his work. And a uh, quote unquote, in one of his documents, he state that um, it's, it, it struggled long before the miseries of bad management. It basically here is the southern India, like southern part of India. He says that before the British government came and conquered southern India, it had very bad management, very bad administration. And therefore, there are there a lot of struggles. People actually suffered a lot. But once the British government came in, it introduced all these nice welfare policies because of which it is benefiting the citizens of the South India, like the people of South India, right? He actually mentions this uh, in one of his accounts. Yeah, he's trying to show English East India Company in a superior format. That's basically the point, right? And he also says that um, if, you, if you study Vijayanagara Empire, Right or like the if English East India Company studies Vijayanagara Empire, it will give them a lot of information regarding the local traditions. Right, what kind of religion are people following? What are the beliefs and customs of people? Yeah, all those customary laws which are prevalent. So if you study Vijayanagara Empire, you will get to know about all of these, and therefore it is easy for you to. Uh, assert your dominance over the empire. That is what Mackenzie advises the English East India Company. Right? So obviously, like the, the fact that he was working on behalf of the English East India government, he will give all these kinds of tips and advices to the British. Right? So 
that is uh, mckenzie for you uh, any doubts still here guys we've covered almost a quite a number of topics any questions still here Okay, Ayush says no doubts and therefore it's clear. Uh, thanks Ayush for responding. Anyways, I'm hoping others are clear as well on this and therefore we'll quickly move to the next slide. We finish this, right. So the next subtopic in your textbook is titled as um, Rayas, Nayakas and Sultans, right. So again, these are the names of the, posi uh, the positions everybody knows what sultans are right sultans are basically kings rayas and nayakas are also kings but these are different terms in the local languages right so they all mean the same thing but muslim people used to call themselves as sultans vijayanagara people call them as rayas and like nayakas were also given the name which was used by certain other kings right so We'll talk about uh, that for a brief time. So, firstly, talking about the origins of Vijayanagara Empire, right? Somebody has to uh, establish the foundation, yeah? So, in that sense, we usually come across two names and these two are brothers actually. They are Harihara and Bukka, right? Very important names, I highly urge you all to remember. So, in the year 1336, right, during the first half of the 14th century itself, two brothers by name Harihara and Bukka, yeah, they actually founded Vijayanagara Empire. If you look at the epigraphic evidences, that is how you get this information, right? So, 1336, this happened and when this was laid out, right, when the Vijayanagara Empire was established, the people living in that particular region are very, very diverse because, um, okay, okay, I'll explain this through some rough diagram. It will be much easier. So let's say this is the territory uh, in the initial days of the Vijayanagara Empire, like when it was founded, let's say there's the territory, right? So one part of the territory, uh, people had different customs. They spoke Kannada, you know, like they had their own religious beliefs. Uh, and the other parts uh, sp spoke in Telugu. They had their own religious beliefs. And coming down, then there's Malayalam spoken here. Then there's um, Tamil spoken here. So like when the kingdom was established, there were so many diverse people living within the empire, within the Vijayanagara empire, who had different uh, languages, who spoke different languages, who dressed differently, who had different customary laws, right? So in the initial days, it was kind of difficult, um, difficult to rule over the kingdom, right? But eventually they coped up with it. Okay, uh, to go back to Ayush's question regarding these brothers were kings of. These brother were king of. Uh, Ayush, if I understand your question correctly, they are not brothers of a particular king. I'm just saying these two are like brothers, right? Like Harihara and Bukka are siblings. Yeah, they had no official connection with any royal families. But they just served under, they had their own occupations, right? I think they were like military generals in one of the empires before. And they saw an opportunity to establish their own kingdom in 1336, right? So these two are brothers. They do not have any official, of uh, any affiliation with other royal families, right? If that is what you're asking, Ayush, I'm hoping you want, uh, you got it. Or if that is not what you asked, please reframe your question. Uh, 
Ayush, we do have information about Harihara and Bukka, right? But it's not a part of your textbook. Like if you go to the bachelor's level or postgraduate level, then probably you will learn about Harihara and Bukka in detail, right? Okay, you got it. Cool. Um, so that was the point, right? Like diverse cultures and diverse traditions. And you, usually in the northern frontier, like the northern borders of the Vijayanagara Empire, there were other kings, like obviously there were other kingdoms, right? So in, in one part of the territory, in one part of the frontier, there were Deccan Sultanates, right? I mentioned these empires to you. There are, there's Golconda, there's uh, Bijapur, there's Bidar, there's uh, Ahmadnagar, right? So all of these Deccan Sultanates are right there in the borders um, surrounding the Vijayanagara king, Kingdom, right? And then on the other side, towards the eastern direction, there are Gajapati rulers of Orissa. Gajapatis are again very, very important powerful kings uh, during the 15th, 14th centuries, right? So, because there are so many empires present in that particular area, there was obviously so much scope for conflict, especially because the land is a very fertile land, right? There are so many rivers flowing there. There's Kaveri, there's Godavari, uh, there's Krishna, there's Tungabhadra, right? Because of all these rivers, the land is very fertile, yeah, fertile river valleys, agriculture was very, very productive. Because of that, to boost their economy, these three kingdoms, like Deccan Sultanates, Gajapatis, and Vijayanagara Empire, they always fought amongst each other. They always, uh, there were always battles between each other for these uh, fertile lands, right? And also for overseas trade. So, point is, there were a lot of conflicts. Yeah. Okay. So at the same time, what was happening? Like on one side, it was some kind of a negative connotation that it always um, led to battles. It always led to wars, killings, bloodshed and all. But on the other side, the advantage of the interconnection between Gajapatis, Vijayanagara and Deccan Sultanate is the exchange of information right because of because these three states are interacting continuously ideas are being shared customs are being shared there was so much of exchange right uh, so when that was happening obviously it's a positive sign you know because let's say for example um, i am a part of the vijayanagara empire and i am going to gajapati's uh, to wage a war or like for some other random purpose and there the agriculture or like the techniques used in agriculture are very, very effective. So when I go there, I will look at it and I will learn it. And therefore come back and implement the same technique in my field. Right? So in that manner, exchange of information is a very, very positive sign because at the end of the day, there are a lot of benefits because of exchanging. Right? So that is like the uh, plus sign of... Um, sorry i got distracted but like that is that is a positive sign of uh, having connections between these three empires right um okay okay tanish has a question regarding the maha menti quiz okay cool uh, tanish as soon as this chapter gets over right like we just started chapter seven I'll try to finish it as quickly as possible. But once this chapter is over, we will have an individual quiz on this chapter, right? And then immediately after that, we'll have a Mahamanti quiz, right? Like all the chapters together, like all the six chapters, right? Um, so that, again, to give you like a rough date, it might take another uh, four or five sessions, right? Another four or five sessions, Tanishq. Uh, not really Tanishq because it's already Wednesday 
and I only have a class on Friday, right? And then there's Sunday because I take classes alternatively, right? For class 12. So I don't think on Sunday we'll be having a quiz, but I'll just tell you prior only when there's a quiz, right? At least uh, three, four days prior, definitely I'll inform you all, right? Don't worry about that. Oh, okay, cool. So especially in the field of arch um, architecture and also agriculture, so many ideas are being exchanged. So when it comes to architecture, right? So Vijayanagara rulers, they were very naive because as I was telling you, they did not have any royal, collect royal connections. So they did not have an art and architecture of their own. So when they went to Deccan Sultanate or when they went to Gajapatis, they observed all these nice sculptures, nice architectures, nice temples, right? And then they came back and they built the temples based on the architectural style of the Gajapatis, right? So especially in terms of architecture, Vijayanagara borrowed a lot from these concepts. And then they further added their own um, indigenity to the element, like their own local element. Right? And yeah, so like before the Vijayanagara Empire was actually established, which is before 1336, there were some other dynasties or kingdoms which were ruling this region, right? For example, Cholas were there in Tamil Nadu or Hoysalas were there in Karnataka, right? So all of their territories were also included into the Vijayanagara Empire gradually, right? Like as the decades passed by. Rulers became very, very powerful. They had nice um, army, effective army, right? And they conquered these territories as well. And ruling elites, uh, elites in these areas, yeah, like the officials or like wealthy people, they had obviously so much uh, money. So they often funded or contributed to the construction of um, several temples right like huge temples like magnificent temples and one of them is a uh, brihadishwara temple at tanjore right tanjore tanjavur it's the same thing right so brihadishwara temple is very very famous again it's in tanjore and then there's a uh, chenna keshava temple which is at belur right belur is also another town in uh, karnataka right so all these temples were actually funded uh, by some of the rich elites. Yeah. And they patronaged all these temples. Right. And last point of the slide is the rulers of Vijayanagara. I was telling you that they called themselves as Rayas. Right. Just like how the Deccan kings called themselves as Deccan Sultanates or Deccan Sultans. In the same manner, Vijayanagara kings call themselves as Rayas, right? Um, they built on all these traditions which they borrowed from other regions, yeah? And then they developed them to a far off level. They usually reach their new heights under Vijayanagara, right? Again, the basic point of all this being, it is a very important empire and it is you know, like it demands our attention. It is worth investing our time on studying about Vijayanagara. Right? So, yeah. So that's the point of um, kings, right? Like what they address them themselves as and all. So on a side note, this these are some, the, these are the some of the points which are mentioned in your textbooks in kind of boxes, but very, very important again. Right? Not source boxes, but like normal boxes. So the first one is uh, titled as Elephants, Horses and Men. Right? So under this, uh, we have uh, the term Gajapati. Right? It literally means the Lord of Elephants. Like what is Gaja? Like Gaja in Sanskrit is elephant. Yeah? Pati is like the owner or like the Lord of Elephants. Right? So there was an entire kingdom or a dynasty which named themselves after elephants. Yeah, basically Gajapatis of Orissa, right? 
who were very very prominent in the 15th century AD so because there were a lot of elephants in Orissa because most of their army comprised of elephant power that is why they named themselves as Gajapatis right and then there's um, Deccan Sultanates usually while they were going to armies they made use of horses a lot right so different kinds of horses so horses in Sanskrit again were called as Ashwas right so because they made use of horses a lot they were referred to as Ashwapatis or Lord of Horses in the same manner Rayas or the kings of Vijayanagara Empire they used so many infant soldiers like soldiers on foot right uh, it's called they are called as lord of men right they, they used to like normally travel on foot and they used to have all these swords or uh, those kind of shields that those are their only weapons you know like mostly they fought with the use of uh, infantry so that's why they're called as narapatis right again these terms are important i highly urge you all to remember like Kajapati, Ashwapati and Narapati, right? Exactly Ayush. That, that, yeah, that's a uh, good remembering. Uh, if you go back to chapter 4, we've also come across these terms of Gajapati and all back in that chapter, uh, chapter also. Right. You're right Ayush. We studied that in chapter 4. Cool. So that was about elephants, horses and men. Right, so elephants is Gajapati, horses is Ashwapati, and men is Narapati. Right, and there's something else called the term which was used called as Karnataka Samrajyamu. Right, so now if we look back uh, uh, retrospectively in the 21st century, we are calling it as Vijayanagara Empire. Right, but Vijayanagara Empire is a term that historians gave, as I was telling you in the starting of the class, right? But in the original days, like in 14, 15, 16 centuries, their contemporary people used to call this empire as Karnataka Samrajyamu. Samrajyamu is nothing but uh, empire, right? The, the mere fact that most of the empire was located in the present day Karnataka region. That is why it is called as Karnataka Samrajyam. Right? So that's like a um, old name or like the original name, let's say. Okay, any questions still here, guys? Uh, Manshi joined us. Uh, hello, Manshi. Uh, okay, Ayush says no questions. Thanks for responding, Ayush. Uh, I'm hoping everybody uh, is on the same page with me, right? Because these basics are important because once you go forward, uh, that will make the chapter much easier. So that's why I'm stressing on the basics a lot. So please follow them. If you all have any qu queries, please put them down in the chat box. Yeah? Okay, so that was about uh, Rayas. So now we'll quickly move on to the next sub theme, which is titled as Kings and Traders, right? So what actually happened, uh, you know, like, uh, what, what is the kind of administration that was carried on? Was there a nice, like effective trade? All of those aspects we'll be talking about in this uh, sub theme. So to start off, Cavalry, right? Like, or the basically the use of horses. Yeah. So, uh, the Ashwa wing of the military. Again, just to give you some kind of background information, which I think I've already mentioned in the previous classes, but just to revise it. So, usually any kind of armies back in those days had uh, four wings, right? Like four different constitutions or four different elements of any army for any kingdom right the first is uh, infantry right 
infantry are basically foot soldiers yeah the next is elephantry right use of elephants in warfare while waging a war then there's a charioty right you know these chariots right like the vehicles um, which are usually tied to horses or some other animals so these chariots were also widely used in some of the wars so that was also like a separate element of the army and then there's finally a uh, cavalry right which is the use of horses in the warfare so out of these four elements of army which are infantry elephantry charioty and cavalry in the southern part of india cavalry gained a lot of importance because of n number of factors right because of um, the availability of horses number 1 because of um, the geographical terrain of the region plateau region right so you usually in the plateaus um, horses are very efficient so because of n number of factors cavalry gained a lot of importance and these horses they were not born and brought up in india in fact they were imported from arabia and central asia right because arabia and central asia are very very conducive like they have all these feasible environments for horses to develop for horses to grow right so once they are fully grown they are imported into the southern part of india via the sea, sea route and also land route right so horses are very effective exactly uh, manshi has a point right like so basically she's saying that if you look at the names of uh, the rulers of the vijayanagara empire like uh, hariharar raya bukka raya krishna deva raya so all these rayas are not their original names the raya is the title that they have given themselves which is the king right so raya is almost there for every vijayanagara king right uh, thanks manshi for pointing that out uh cool uh ridham joined us um hi ridham anyways so quickly moving on to the uh cavalry thing which we were talking about so i was telling these were important right so whatever trade was happening um again to be very clear if the horses are being imported from arabia then the sea route was followed but if the horses are being imported from central asia then usually they were imported via land right so central asia land arabia sea or water yeah so all of this trade was initially controlled by the arab traders yeah arab traders were very very wealthy they were very rich they had this monopoly over the import of um, horses into the indian subcontinent right but later on like as uh, years passed by even the local communities of karnataka and tamil nadu they also started interfering into the horses trade yeah there's one particular community of merchants which were called as kudire chattis the spelling is here guys it's kudire chattis chattis again i'm not sure of the pronunciation but these are basically referred to as the horse merchants because their sole occupation is involving in the horse trade right so in the later days these uh, community of people also started indulging in the horse trade right that was there but there's a third group of people who also involved in this horse trade and this was happening from 1498 right so again what is 1498 like what is the significance of 1498 it is the year where basically vasco da gama who was a portuguese sailor he started like he was on a long trip from portugal that is the year where he basically arrived in india right like he discovered india so that is how portuguese actually entered the indian subcontinent in the year 1498 and once they came in 
पोर्चुगीज ऑल्सो स्टार्टेड इंडल्जिंग इन द हॉर्स ट्रेड राइट okay uh manchi yes you got the point i i'm not very uh, proficient in hindi so therefore my lessons uh, will be only be in english but uh, ayush i'm not from karnataka that's a wrong information i'm not from karnataka um cool so where were we right like we, we, we were talking about portuguese so in 1498 portuguese came in they started indulging in horse trade as well and usually while they were coming in vasco da gama first encountered onto the west coast right because again just to give you like a rough let's say this is like the v tip uh, like the peninsula tip of india right there is portugal somewhere here so when he was carrying on his voyage he started from portugal and through the uh, arabian sea he traveled to the west coast of the indian subcontinent right there are some travelers who traveled all the way like down the indian ocean and then they reached the east coast via bay of bengal but vasco da gama did not do that in fact any portuguese did not do that they directly came from portugal to the uh, via arabian sea to the west coast right so once these portuguese arrived on the west coast initially their motive was only to carry out trade activities but later on they tried to capture the territories of india they had their own military or armies there and started waging wars against the local kingdoms that is a totally different history which we look about in the second term right like after your first term first term boards are over then we'll talk about portuguese east india company british right so for now just remember that there are three actors involved in the th- trade the first is um, the arab traders the second is the local communities called as kudre chattis and the third is third is portuguese right okay so another point about the portuguese is uh, they had a superior military technology right obviously like they are western westernized people they, they are much more advanced than the indian subcontinent people so obviously they will have good weapons good arms and ammunition superior military technology so that basically means that by 1498 itself they had muskets uh muskets are basically these long guns right guns are usually this shorter but if you look at all these long guns they are called as muskets right so portuguese were already using them by 1498 and because they had an advantage of the muskets they were able to easily um, win the wars or win the battles which they, which they were carrying out in the indian subcontinent against the local communities right so the whole credit goes to the military technology and not just the trade of horses but vijayanagara was also noted for its trade in spices textiles and precious stones right again the southern part of india very very famous for spices and also textiles uh, some kind of stones were also found like lapis lazuli and all so all of these were imported to um, exported to other regions in the world be it central asia or be it to china or southeast asia vijayanagara was very much thriving because it had all these flourishing markets right and trade was often considered as a status symbol right let's say i am a merchant and i am involved in trading of spices i would have a high social standing in the society people will respect me people will think i'm wealthy or i'm rich you know like i'm a well to do person so that is like a symbolic statute of trade right that was very very important and usually who will be involved in trade is the wealthy populations right because only when you are wealthy you can invest so much in trade and because of that it also means that 
because the populations are wealthy they demanded all these high value exotic goods like all the luxury goods right like jewelry is seen as some kind of luxurious item let's say i want a chain and i don't want to have the local stones embedded into the into the chain but i want stones to be imported from let's say europe so only if i'm rich i'll be able to afford it right like basic principles of how society works so because the pe- people were involved in trade that is this point is telling us that the vijayanagara empire in general is very very wealthy right because of its flourishing trade right and then lastly the revenue derived from trade in turn it contributed to the prosperity of the state and what is the connection so the connection basically is here is once i am involved in trade i have to pay a certain amount of tax to the kingdom right be it any kind of tax i have to pay a tax and there was a lot of revenue actually generated for the state just based on the taxes alone and state further used these taxes to carry out so many welfare schemes you know like for other prosperous activities in the state so it's like a circle right like state is giving me uh, all the infrastructure to carry out trade i am doing trade i am paying tax to the state and state is again providing me with the infrastructure right it's like a whole circle it's a never ending cycle right so that again is the contribution of trade in the development of the vijayanagara empire in general right okay cool so that basically brings us to the end of topic for today i'm glad we completed this on time um uh not a problem ayush based on your accent cool uh any questions till here guys uh, because i know there's only like the introductory part of the chapter but there's a lot of information i've kind of dumped on right so any questions please uh, feel free to ask in the chat box <laughs> yes class indeed ended early ayush cool uh okay basically no questions um uh, that's fair enough but if you have any like general questions regarding anything that we have talked about till now this chapter some other chapters queries re- related to any doubts or examinations anything uh, just put them in the chat box i'll have a look at them but in the meanwhile i'll try to wind this session up right so dashra season so basically we are having offers on um, the subscriptions right there's a dashra dhamaka offer going on and th- this basically valid till 18th of october right for five more days and uh, have a look at them right there are uh, free cbse subscriptions there are free creative corner subscriptions just go through it the link is in the description below uh, and feel free to enroll to whichever one you want to right and yeah as i was telling you you can use the code which is tum10 to get a 10% off straight away on the subscriptions and lastly uh, if you like the content of these videos please do like it share it as much as possible and also subscribe to the channel an academy and scholars in particular right thank you guys uh, thank you so much for tuning in if you all have any questions just uh, stay back but others are free to leave right okay ayush has a random question but yeah i'll answer that regarding the usage of the word indeed when will you use it i i mean roughly speaking when something is so obvious to you you know like you already know the fact or like it's it's, a, it's an estab- established point or something is super obvious to you then probably you can ma- use the word indeed 
Yeah, I think that's the answer. Cool. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Okay, I do not see any further questions, therefore it's time for me to wind up the session. But before going, uh, before leaving, let me just say that um, like technically, like conventionally, the next class is supposed to be on um, Friday, right? Usually it's for, um, sorry, usually it's going to be at 6 p.m. But the fact that we are running out of time and we also need to cover this chapter, I'm taking another class on Friday at um, 11 a.m., right? So basically the next time I'll be going to see you is on Friday 11 a.m. followed by Friday 6 p.m. So Friday we'll be having two classes, right? I'm hoping that's okay with you. Yeah, so I'm hoping everybody will tune in on Friday 11 a.m. I'll see you guys there. Cool. Chalo then. Uh, so that was the only point I wanted to mention. That brings us to the end of the class. Um, I'll see you guys. Till then, have a good evening and also have a good day tomorrow. Right? And be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ayush, definitely not a problem. You can literally ask me anything you want to. Right? You, you do not need to be sorry about it. Chillax. Cool. Chalo then. Um, bye.